take for granted. Those around us, our brothers and sisters, Lord, that, that you have led it to us and that, and that you've blessed us with. Father, I pray that we be good stewards and that we encourage and, and teach one another in your ways. Father, I thank you for letting me be a part of such a young generation that you are bringing up in your ways that I'm getting to be a part of their growth in you. What an honor. I thank you, Lord, for that. I thank you, Father, for giving me a husband who is diligent who is faithful to you, who listens to you. He does his best to walk in your ways. I thank you for giving him a talent of, of being able to read your word and, and, and be able to demonstrate it to us in a way that we would understand it, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray, Father, that, that you would set a people in this community on fire for you, that they would want to hear your true word, and that you would lead, that you would lead people here, Lord, the new generation that you're bringing up, Father, that you're leading here. That we could grow in you. <coughs> and that we could continue in that. I love you, Lord. I thank you now for the for the word that you're bringing to all of us, Lord, and that, that each of us would be given a word today and that we would take it with us, Lord, and that we would use it this week and that we could use it to minister to someone else. And that it would stick out to us, Lord, that we would be able, that we would be able to praise you and, and see that you had a word just for us. I love you, Lord. Protect these that are here, Father. And bless them. In your son, Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Malik. Where to begin? Where to begin today? Got a lot that I want to go over. The theme today will probably be um, discipleship and what we are, we are actually called to do, regardless of what capacity that that is um, discipleship uh, can come from any platform as I've said before we're either a wit we're all we're all witnesses now whether we're a good witness or a bad witness that remains the question um, and a lot of times when we're dealing with scripture we have so much false ideas that have already been given to us from the world and from the false church and it's hard to break down these barriers. It's hard to break down what is false, what is true. And if we do not read God's word, then um, how are we to know what the standard of truth really is? And so if you look down here, I've got a sword. And it's one of my favorite, uh, more pronounced uh, ideas of what being a disciple is, is, is that sword. Um, we're told in Ephesians um, 6 that the sword is truth. And in, in Hebrews 4.12, it's 
12. Yeah, Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts even to the dividing of being or the flesh and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom is our account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, that being Jesus, Yeshua, who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who was tried in all aspects as we are apart from a sin, from sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace in order to receive compassion and find grace for the timely help. Now, Jesus says that we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The writer of Hebrews here, which is still debated today who the writer was, and so uh, we're not going to go into that, but he says that the word of God, the word, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, if you look at that, that's what a two-edged sword looks like, whereas like your household knife that you use only has the one edge. But the, the two-edged sword there, meaning that when you plunge it into to a body, it not only cuts down, but it cuts up at the same time. The word is living and active, meaning that it can, it can walk us through whatever trial or tribulation or whatever um, expectation we have or even whatever we are exalting in the name of God at any given moment in our lives. Meaning that whenever I read this one passage today, it's going to have a little different bearing on my life. It doesn't mean that it's changed its meaning. It just means that it bears on my life a little different than it would have a year ago. Or a little different than it would a week from now. Because it is living and active. It's able to not only encourage us, but at the same time, it can, it can correct us. And so, that, that sword. But if we have these... If we go into reading the word of God with a false idea of what we want it to say, we're automatically going to assume or presume what it says, and we are going to miss the point. Now, this sword here is um, what we normally think of whenever we hear Jesus tell Peter, go get a sword, sell your cloak and go buy a sword. But that's not correct. This would be more like what Peter would have carried on his side. And so this also is a double-edged sword. Now in the time of Peter and the disciples, the sword had many uses. It was used for everyday things, whether it be cutting some limbs up to build a fire or, or opening up. Well, they didn't have cans back then, but it would be for um, preparing their food to cook. Um, it had several uses. Well, so is the word of God. It can, it can have several uses and several meanings. Deep meanings. Um, surface level meanings. Now, when I say different meanings, I don't mean that this passage means one thing to you and something totally different than me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it has depth and it has roots in what, what we're reading. Like whenever we read the Old Testament, um, God is not only speaking directly to a specific people and a specific time for their specific needs, but that underlying message is what we know as foreshadowing of, of things to come. And it can, it can have bearing on our lives as well. And so we can't just read the Bible at face value and call it a day. <clears throat> now, um, in discipleship, If we had a, a, a group of people that, that we needed to reach with the truth, it makes more sense that I would teach one or two, and those one or two would go out and teach, and those would go out and teach. That's called multiplication. Or if I had to do it all by myself and go out and teach every individual, I'm not going to reach, for one, as many people, and two, I just, it's not time, it's not time worthy. 
You know, it's, it's a waste of time, not a waste of time, but it's going to consume more time than need be. So we, so we make disciples. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was only on the earth in ministry for what we know him as is three years, three and a half years. And we think, man, what he could have accomplished if he'd have been here for 100 years or 50 years. Why not? Because he wanted to teach us the basic elements and the essence of the importance of discipleship. Now, like I said earlier, you can either be a good witness or a bad witness. You can be a good disciple or a bad disciple. One or the other, you're going to do it. It's like Joshua says that, choose you this day whom you will serve. I promise you, you're going to serve someone or something. You're not going to be neutral ever. You're either going to serve yourself, your flesh, and its lust, or you're going to serve the, the, the serpent and, and the evilness, or you're going to serve God. Jesus goes further to tell us that we can't mix and match. We can't do both. Because Proverbs tells us that, that a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Being a double-minded man is, is one who contradicts his actions and his sayings all the time. If I told y'all to act one way and y'all see me act in a total different way, how much, how much varying uh, truth are you going to put on what I say? Not a whole lot, right? And so it's important that not only do I teach these things and these ideas from, from Scripture, but I also live it. And whenever I fall short, in which I will and I do, to make sure that we call it out. We don't try to cover it up and hide it. That's the biggest thing that we want to do in this culture. And really it's mankind's um, mantra from the beginning. Because when, when Eve partook of the, the fruit that she was not supposed to, and then give it to her husband, and God comes to the husband because it's his responsibility and says, what have you done? What's his first reaction? It's hard. Matter of fact, there's one that you give me, God. So let's blame God and someone else. We don't want to take responsibility for our own actions. <clears throat> that was the big difference between King David and King and King Saul. Was that David, when when presented with his foulness, failures, with his sin, he quickly repented and gave glory to God, showing that you know that. I didn't sin against this person, per se. I sinned against you, God. Giving God the ultimate power and authority in his life. And so, as I, as I begin reading some of this this week, um, and still looking at church history, and what drives all of these different denominations, all of these different paths, um, per se, to the one truth. What drives all this? And, it, and as I look at it, the root being that it's man's lust. It's man's pride. So with that, let's go to, um, let's look at Proverbs 28 real quick. Proverbs 28, we'll start in verse 1. Now we know that in Genesis 2, chapter 2, God's, in God's account of creation, that when he creates the man, he has the man, he gives man authority over all living beings, all beasts. And, and we know that because he says, here are all of the beasts, you name them. Well, when you give them name, you have authority. And so we see that authority, and God says, find a suitable helper for me. He could not find a suitable, suitable helper amongst all of these beasts because there wasn't one. God was making it clear to him that I am going to give you the suitable helper. And so after he creates Eve from the rib or from what the, the Hebrew says, the side of man. Adam says, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. I will call it, call her woman, woman. And God says, it's not good that man be alone. It's not. Go, go walk yourself up for a period of time and hide from all mankind and see how crazy you will go in your mind. 
when I first started when I first started pumping and I was in that truck by myself day in and day out it drove me bonkers because for almost 20 years I'd always worked with a crew around people now I'm not a big people person I like to keep to myself but I still need people you know it's important not only is it important that for our psychological understanding of of our being it's key to our witness it's key to our purpose and position in life you know the the famous philosophical question what's the purpose of our lives well if we read scripture it's plain and simple it's to glorify god you know but if we walk outside of scripture then yeah that purpose can become anything so therefore that brings us right back to the standard that god's word has to be our standard of existence our standard of living and so as we as we see that adam is told it's not good that that he be alone and gives him a help me a helper suitable for him not one below not one beneath not one behind not one in front but but equal in comparison to needs <clears throat> but very differently see a perfect marriage a good marriage is from two people who are completely different opposites you know you hear the the old saying opposites attract was key because i don't need someone who's exactly like me who has the strengths of me who who can operate in the same capacity as me i don't need that i already have that in me i need someone who can pick up my slack and they need someone who, who can pick up their slack and that's why it's important that we follow the biblical text of man and woman <clears throat> so then we're going to look at that today all right, let's look at Proverbs 28.1 with that little bit of background. The wrong shall flee when no man pursues. Or the wrong shall flee when no one pursues. But the righteous are as bold as lion because of the transgression of land. There are many rulers. Like the wrong flee because no one pursues. If we look at that from what Solomon meant there, um, look at the world today. If I say, you know what, I believe in Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, I'm going to get repercussion. I'm going to get forced. Um, people are going to come against me because it's a truth that they don't want to grapple with or they don't want to latch on to. If I go out in the world and I say I believe in unicorns and leprechauns, <laughs> you're crazy, right? There's no big deal. You can believe anything you want as long as it's not truth. And if that truth contradicts someone, then you're going to feel their, their uh, attack upon you. And so the, the, the righteous are bold as lions is I'm going to stand on this truth, but the wicked flee when no one pursues. Meaning that that falls that if it's not true what difference does it make if it if it has no truth you can believe whatever you want we don't care i don't care that you believe in little sky sky people that come down and flying saucers i don't care nobody cares it's accepted let everybody be their own it's to each his own unless you believe in the truth and you walk in the truth then it's oh absolutely not hold up and so we are to be bold as lions as we come before the throne of grace. When it says many are the rulers. I go back and as I look at all these different denominations of Christianity. And different um, views in religion. Whether it be Buddha or Muhammad or Jesus. Those being the three prevalent. It all stems from those three beliefs. But then in that, it's just, it's a, a shattered glass, if you would, if you would of, of directions and paths that people want to take to get to these different gods. And it's, it's uncanny. Well, each one has their own idea of faith, their own idea of these are the rules and these are what we're going to stick by. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees that if you went across the lake and you made a disciple, he would be twice the devil you are. You're going to teach him so much fallacies that he's going to be wicked and evil. 
It's the same thing we got going on today in our in our wicked churches. Is you know, uh, like I spoke on a little bit last week on just just baptism alone. I was told when I first started coming to church that if I didn't get baptized before I die, I was going to go to hell. How ridiculous was that? I didn't know any better. I'm like, okay, well, let's get it done. But then there was a specific set way that he said I had to be baptized, which was also a fallacy. And so you take all of these different ideas and doctrines and dogmas of men and you pile them up. No wonder no one wants anything to do with Jesus. I didn't because this is the way you're supposed to look. This is the way you're supposed to act when it comes to being in the church. You can't go to church if you don't dress like this. You can't go to church if you don't look like this. You can't go to church if you don't believe this. Why don't we read what Jesus says about it? See, a lot of things that we get in trouble with with our doctrines and dogmas of men today is we take something that Paul said, and that becomes gospel. That becomes the only way that it can be. It's written in stone. Meaning that if we take it and it contradicts what God said you to do or not to do, it doesn't matter because Paul said it. And so we take the authority from God and we give it to Paul. That's partly the definition of blasphemy is, is to put yourself in a position of God. Whether it to be forgive sins or whether it be to, to change what God said. When I begin seeking out a matter... When I begin looking at something that's controversial or not clear, I have to go back. I start at Genesis and I work my way forward of what God said about it. And if he said it this way, did he change it anyway? And you're not going to find where he changes his mind, his attitude, or his laws and decrees. You're not going to find it. And so when we read different individuals that say otherwise, and and we perceive it as being said otherwise, we need to rethink it. We need to relook at it because they're not going to say anything that contradicts God if it's inspired works of man, of God through man. So Paul's not going to say anything that would contradict God's law. He's not. What we forget to, what we tend to do here in this Western culture is have the Western mindset of like I've said before, everything is linear. Where, where the Eastern mindset is, is cyclical, cyclic here. They thought in a completely different idea and mindset than we do. So when Paul says certain things, let's just use uh, uh, the dietary law for one example. When Paul says that this is made clean, he does, he's not even thinking that these dudes are out here eating uh, pork chops. Nobody eats pork chops in that culture. So why would, he, why would that be in his mindset? But in our culture, it's very prevalent. So therefore, we automatically change it. Let's take blessings. When we hear that God is going to bless us in our ways, that automatically equates to most Western thinking as finances, as money. If God's going to bless me, it's got to be money. Because money is our, is our key to, to existence in this culture. And it has been for, for many generations. All right, so that's our many rulers. <clears throat> we continue on. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, right is maintained. A poor man who oppresses the poor is like a sweeping rain that leaves no food. It's a flood. Those who forsake the Torah praise the wrong. And those who guard the Torah strive with them. Evil men do not understand right ruling, but those who seek Yahweh understand all. Better is the poor who walk in his integrity than one perverse in his ways who is rich. He who watches over the Torah is a discerning son. All right, let's stop right there. He who watches over the Torah is a discerning son. That gives us a, a little clue into when we go back to Adam and Eve. And in that same chapter that Adam and Eve is, is created, um, at the end of, of chapter 2, it says that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Well, how could Adam leave his father and mother and cling to his wife if Adam's the first created being? 
Have we ever thought about that? I did not until here a while back, and so it didn't make no sense to me. Why would why would that be? How could that be the case? So either we got a discrepancy in the Bible, or we got a misunderstanding. Or I hear it plainly says, "He who keeps the and watches over the Torah is a discerning son." It gives us a clue that the Torah, that God's laws and His Word, is like a father and a mother to us. If we read Proverbs and Psalms and, and the Book of Wisdom, we're constantly seeing. It goes back to that different meanings we were talking about when we first started. We're constantly seeing her. What is her? It depends on the context. It depends on whether you're whether you're dealing with a physical woman, which it is, all times. It's also dealing with the spiritual woman, her, and it's dealing with the church, her. Right? So, so her being the mother. <coughs> and as we begin reading different things like this, and we see contradictions. Don't look at it as it is a contradiction, but go, where am I missing the point? You know, like last week we were talking about the rich young ruler and how Jesus had that conversation with the rich young ruler and it went all the way back to what God said to, to operate like in Deuteronomy 26 or 25. Jesus didn't just come out and just make things up. He constantly led us back to the beginning, to the Torah, to, to the instruction of God to us. He didn't just make things up. Neither does Paul. And so when we read things that are contradictory, that we, we deem contradictory, we need to do a little more digging, a little understanding, so that we can go, hey, wait a minute. This ain't a contradiction. Because you're going to meet people over and over in your lives who may claim to believe God, but don't really believe God, and they will have overwhelming questions for you that if you don't understand and you don't dig yourself, you're not gonna be able to answer. And that may be someone key in your life that you really want them to get God, like you have God. It goes back to the discipleship. We're all disciples, some way, shape, form, or fashion. We all have a testimony in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Many of us think, well, because my testimony is not as extreme as that guy's. I didn't go from being a rapist and a murderer to loving Jesus. I've just been kind of an okay person. I don't have a testimony. That's not correct. Everyone has a testimony, regardless of how extreme that testimony may be. And some of us can have multiple testimonies. But those testimonies is to relate to someone who's going through what you went through. Now, we don't all have the exact same issues, but some of us can have similar issues. I can relate to someone who is a giant alcoholic. I can relate to someone who done drugs. I can relate to someone who, who cheated on their wife. I can relate to different people at different positions. <clears throat> That's why it's a testimony. Let's turn to... Uh, Let's go to Titus. Titus, Titus, Titus. It's in the New Testament. It's one not talked about very much, and it's pretty short. Now, Titus was a disciple of Paul. That Paul, um, I believe the book of Titus was written um, to, to Titus on what's going on in the, in the island of Crete, which is a, an island of excuse me, an island from Greece. And so Paul has, the, the, the church had already been set up in this, this island, but then they began following false, false narratives and false ideas, kind of like we talked about with the sword. And so Paul sends Titus and says, look, let's get them grounded in this faith. And so let's start in Titus chapter one. Now this is going to look at discipleship from the female point of view here shortly when we get to chapter two. Paul, a servant of Elohim and apostle of Yeshua Messiah, according to the belief of Elohim's chosen ones and knowledge of truth according to reverence, in expectation of everlasting life, which Elohim, who does not lie, promised before times of old, but in its own times has manifested his word through preaching. 
with which I was entrusted according to the command of Elohim, our Savior, to Titus, a genuine child, according to our common faith, grace and compassion, peace from Elohim the Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you should straighten Straighten out what was left undone and appoint elders in every city as I command you. <clears throat> if anyone is unreprovable, the husband of one wife, having believing children, not accused of loose behavior or unruly, for an overseer has to be unreprovable as managing one of Elohim, not self-pleasing, not wroth, and not giving to wine. No brawler, nor greedy filth of gain. But be kind to strangers, a lover, a lover, a lover of what is good and sensible, righteous and set apart, self-controlled, clinging to the trustworthy word according to the teaching, in order to be able to both encourage by sound teaching and to convict those who oppose it. Right, that goes back to the word being able to, to encourage us and convict us and teach us. That's that two-edged sword. For there are many unruly men and senseless talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths have not stopped, who upset entire households in teaching what they should not teach for the sake of filthy gain. That has not changed any today. There's wicked, deceiving pastors and wolves. There are wolves in sheep's clothing teaching us certain doctrines and dogmas of men that are false. And it leads us astray because we will not do our own diligence. Now, Paul is telling Titus, go and set this up like this. I mean, we, we, you have to have an, a hierarchy when it comes to following God. You've got to have those teachers and those preachers and those who are servants. You've got to have these elements of people and positions and platforms in order for this to be successful. If you have teachers but no one to teach, what good is it? If you have students and no teacher, what do we have? So Paul's telling him, all right, look, this, this, is, this is the place I'm sending you. Because they're, they're, the good news has come to them. Jesus has been taught to them, but then no one followed up. No one stuck around and said, all right, this is what we need to do from here. A lot, a lot like what we have today in modern cultural Christianity. Come down to the altar, say the sinner's prayer, and you're good. Be gone. We view that as the ending of our walk with God. Rather than what it should be, the beginning. Back to discipleship. All of us should have someone we disciple. Whether it be a younger brother or a sister or a friend or a co-worker. We should have someone we disciple. If we're not, then we need to look and reevaluate our lives. Verse 10. For there are many unruly men, senseless talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Now, Paul's talking directly when he says, especially those of circumcised. He's talking specifically about the scribes and Pharisees and the Jews. Now, he, he, does, he, he lumps them into one category, but not an end-all, be-all there. In other words, there are some Jews that's, that's not doing this, but as a whole, this is the case. A lot like whenever I talk down or talk about this false Christianity that we have today. I'm not everyone who identifies as Christian. I'm not putting everyone in the category of wicked and evil. I'm putting it as a religion of a whole. It's wicked and evil. Same thing Paul's doing here. In verse 11 he says, whose mouths have not stopped. There's some people just always got an opinion, always got a reason. Somebody's always knows more than you. Someone who's already done it bigger, better, faster, and so forth. Whose mouths do not stop. If we are always talking and never hearing, how are we going to learn anything? There used to be that, um, when I was a kid, a, a commercial about the owl. And I can't remember exactly what it was 
portray him, but um, the, the, the basic message was is the owl hardly ever speaks. Has always got his head on a 360 swivel and he's listening. He's learning, ever learning. Where you've got like the, the hyena who's always barking. The little jappy dog always barking. They never learning nothing. They're just open. They just got their mouth running. <clears throat> we all know someone like that. And if we don't, we might be that one. <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> Whose mouths have not stopped to upset entire households is and teaches which they should not teach for the sake of gain. Now, there's a lot of money to be made in, in, in uh, religion today. I mean, look on TBN. You'll see people, you'll see certain individuals, prominent individuals that are wealthy beyond means. It's not wrong to have wealth. God doesn't say that. But what do you do with it? It goes back to the rich young ruler. If, the, if your possessions and your wealth is more important than giving to your brother or your neighbor, for that matter, then you have issue. And you're probably, your heart is not for God. Verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This witness is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply in order for them to be sound in faith. Not paying attention to Yehudi fables and commands of men who turn from the truth. Now, Yehudi fables, that's Jewish fables. That's the, the doctrines and dogmas of men. That's um, one of them is... Um, a command is do not uh, do not cook do not cook a goat or a kid in its mother's milk, and so for that command alone that God gave, and the Jews took it as you cannot eat meat and drink milk because it would get in your stomach and mix together, and and it would be just like cooking a kid in its mother's milk, and so they had these these long drawn out processes of uh, why you could not eat meat, or eat meat and drink milk, and which which one was it, Tabby? That uh, were the cheeses a prominent? Yeah, um, I forget. It's one of the, the one. one of the observances. I believe it's uh, the maybe the Day of Atonement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the commanded. Um, Jewish feast or Israel feast days, I almost said Jewish feast days. One of the commanded feast days of God, the appointed times, um, the, the, the Jews take that as this is the time that we're going to eat cheese, we're going to eat, drink milk, but we're not going to eat no meat because we don't want to have this, this, this screw up. You know, we don't want to disobey God. That's just one of many fables, wives' tales, or additions to God's word that they had done with God's word. They had made it to where it was almost, well, for certainly impossible to follow, but they had made it to where he didn't even, who would want to? Who would want to walk in this way? <clears throat> so Paul's saying, don't pay attention to these fables and commands of men who turn from the truth. Indeed, all matters are clean to the clean. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, no matter is clean. But both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. That goes back to our motives. If a, if a serial killer by night goes out through the day and helps little old ladies across the street and, and even brings them groceries for no cost, no pay, does that make him good? No, his motives are wrong. He's trying, for whatever the case may be, either justifying what he does at night or, or to, to carry a persona of, look at him, he's so cool. And we would never guess that he's the one doing all these murders. Well, it's the same thing that we do when we go to church. Most of us. A lot of us. I go to church, look at me. Look at my new suit today. Look at my fancy shoes. I am so good that I go to church. Just don't let the message go over 30 minutes because I guarantee you I'm going to get, I got things to do. Hurry up, preacher. 
What is our motive? What is our motive for following God? That's what Paul is saying right here. Many profess to know God, but their works deny it. All right, let's look at the discipleship here that, that we're going to look at from the female. See, as as there are more women here than, than men, and y'all are young, um, this is really going to pertain to you. And so listen up. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, But you speak what is fitting for sound teaching. The older men are to be sober, serious, sensible, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. The older women, likewise, are to be apart, to be set apart in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of what is good, in order for them to train the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, blameless, workers at home, good, and subject to their own husbands, in order that the word of Elohim is not spoken evil of. Which the word of Elohim being spoken evil of is actually um, taking the Lord's name in vain. It's not a specific word. It's it's using God's uh, truths, twisting them, and making God to be a liar, God to be false. That is actually taking the Lord's name in vain, which is um, number three on the the Ten Commandments. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Which is another fable, false tale that will, well, you can't say, gee, gee, or that's, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, that's, that's part of it. But to take the Lord's name in vain is, is to come to church. Hey, look at me. I went to church this week. And I go to Bible study. Yeah, but you were cussing out the lady at all sorts because she wasn't fast enough. And you were sitting around with all the other people in line joking and making fun of her and just making her day go from bad to worse. What is your, what, what's your purpose? What's, your, what's the end game look like? Where's your heart at? Yeah, but I go to church. So what? Verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Show yourself to them an example of good works in all matters. In teaching and show uncorruptness and seriousness. Soundness of speech beyond reproach. In order that the opponent is put to shame. Having no evil word to say about you. I get accused of a lot of things. Because of my beliefs. Too many to even go into. One thing they can't deny is that I love my God. That's the way we all should be. They may be able to say a lot of things about you, but your faith in God is not one that will that will be in question. The problem most of the time lies into what God you are serving, what God you have that faith in. Because when I speak the truth the way I speak it, many, have, many look at that and go, well, that's not how you're supposed to act. That's not how a preacher is supposed to act. Well, what's a preacher supposed to act like? Please explain. What's a, dis a disciple supposed to act like? Please explain. Clarify yourself. The problem is, is, is when we walk and claim the truth, no, we don't look like the average, the normal, everyday, um, popular pastor or disciple or servant. We don't. And we're not supposed to. We're supposed to be set apart in all that we do. But too often times we're like, well... If I set myself apart, I'm going to get attacked by this group and this group. So I'm just going to cling to this group over here because they're the closest resemblance to what I like. Which is why we have so many different denominations. <clears throat> Verse 9, servants should be subject to their own masters. Well pleasing in every way, but not back talking. Not stealing, but showing all good trustworthiness. So that they adorn the teaching of Elohim, our Savior in every way. For the saving gift of Elohim has appeared to all men. The saving gift is Jesus. 
instructing us to renounce wickedness and worldly lusts and to live sensibly, righteously, and reverently in the present age. Now, verse 12 is key. Paul tells Timothy, this is how you are to teach them. Instruct them to renounce or to declare that wickedness must be thrown away, worldly lust put away, and to live sensibly, righteously. All right? Now, we've defined righteous. Righteous is walking blameless in the ways of God. So if all of God's not, if, if those who today say, well, you know what, the fourth, keep the Sabbath, that's been done away with, or this one has been done away with. How? When? Who said it? If God didn't change it, and, and, and Jesus says, I come not to change or abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it, that's not change, that's not destroying it, that's not putting it away. So how do we get that Paul says otherwise? He's specifically instructing Titus here to teach them to live sensibly and righteously and give in reverence to God in that present age. Looking for the blessed expectation and glory and honor appearance of the great Elohim and our Savior Messiah. All right, the blessed expectation is the, is the final return of Christ, the final return of Yeshua. <clears throat> who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people. Cleanse for himself a people. What did Jesus say? I come not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I didn't come from, I didn't come from Buddha. I didn't come from, from Muhammad. I didn't come from Christianity. I, came from the, I come for the lost sheep, the saints of the house of Israel. It goes back to what we read earlier, where we are not um, we are not following a God that can't sympathize or empathize or understand our our plight and struggling with sin, because Jesus came and struggled against temptation. That's what he spent forty days in the desert with, and, and the devil come and, and uh, physically and directly tried to trip him up. With sin, with things that would give him that would be lustful in his eyes. Go forty days without eating, and then let me show you a piece of bread and see if I don't make you hungry. Go two days without eating, and you're ready to give it up. So Jesus understands our struggle with sin. That's why the forgiveness and the grace comes into play. Speak these matters, verse 15, speak these matters, urge and convict with all authority and let no one despise you. Let no one despise you. Y'all can say whatever you want about me. I don't care. I'm going to speak the truth, whether it hurts your feelings or whether it encourages you. I'm going to speak the truth in God no matter what. And now what you do with it, that's up to you. That's what Paul is instructing Titus to go in and teach these, these people. It all goes back to discipleship. Why I identify as a disciple rather than a Christian or a Muslim or, or whatever. I just want to be a disciple. A disciple is just a student, a student of something. A disciple that I'm speaking of is a student of Jesus. If we look at the doctrines and dogmas of men as a whole, we'll see the flaws and the fallacies if we understand the word. God didn't do away with his law because Jesus said, I come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle. That's pretty clear to me. It's not a metaphor. It's not, well, you know, um, whatever you deem to be long. No, Jesus says, until heaven and earth pass away, which is still here, 
Not one jot, not one tittle. Now that one jot, one tittle in the Hebrew writing is, is those little apostrophes that you'll see by words or maybe the little thing across the top of it. That's a jot or a tittle. And in Hebrew, in, in what little bit I understand about Hebrew is you can take a word that's got the same letters and the same spelling, but add that jot or tittle, completely changes the meaning. Completely in opposite. Just by one jot or one tittle. The English language has 28 letters in its, its alphabet. The Hebrews only had 22 letters in their alphabet. And it was mainly where we'll use an exclamation point to, to proclaim excitement of a sentence, authority. They would say it in repetition. So that's why when we see Jesus say, verily, verily, I say unto you. When he says it twice, you better pay attention. Which is also why, when I'm reading scripture, if he only says it in one book or one sentence, and I can't find that concept nowhere else, I'm probably misunderstanding that concept. Because God is going to back up and back up and double back up and double check everything that is said. He's not going to, excuse me, not going to leave anything up for question for us that is important. We do a good enough job of that on our own, and the English language is real good at that. The English language can get us so confused on truth, it's not even funny. Our political correctness today is even further deviating that truth and that understanding. That's it, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another blessed day. We thank you that We thank you that we are diligent to, to seek your truth. And that we, we thank you that you have left a remnant to, to lead, guide, and teach us. That we will one day be the diligent ones to lead, guide, and teach the next generation. Until your final coming. Father, as we go out in this dark world, let us pray that you give us strength and encouragement to be that light in this dark world. And that our hunger and desire would be to seek you first and foremost above all things. We pray all these things in your son's mighty name.